My name is Stephanie Schura. I'm an associate professor at the School of Economics at the University of Sydney. And my research focus is the economics of human development, which I would say is a relatively new part of welfare economics and which really studies the, um, the dynamics of skills, character traits and health over the life course. And studies also the possible ways of how we can impact upon these skill or character trajectories. This really is a new area of research, so it has only come into um, mainstream economics in the last five to ten years, because economists traditionally always looked at, for instance, character skills or socio-emotional skills or personality traits as something that's fixed and that doesn't develop over the life course. But so in these last, really in the last decade, researchers have asked, well, can we actually shape um, character traits or personality traits? And this is exactly the type of research that I'm doing. And I'll focus in particular on uh, socioeconomic gradients in these character traits or socio-emotional skills or personality traits and to understand the reasons why these socioeconomic gradients emerge. I'm zooming into the factors that may cause uh, unfavorable character formation over the life course. And of course, you can't understand these skill trajectories without looking into the family. So I really understand the family as the key producer of human development over the life course. So a lot of my research tries to understand, first of all, how dynamic and how malleable are these character traits. So the last years I've spent a lot of my time on understanding when are the, mo the best windows of opportunity. So in adulthood we realize that character traits, they're not really very dynamic anymore. There are some variations over four to eight year windows, but we can't really explain them. And the changes are so small that we really think there's a lot of stability in these traits. And traditional life events that we economists consider like family related, health related, or labor market related life events, they're not shifting these personality traits. And because we found that my research has tried to um, look at earlier and earlier and earlier periods. So we replicated this type of research um, for adolescents and young adults and find surprisingly stable are these character traits by this age. There's a couple of character traits that are a little bit more malleable. So for instance, one trait I had studied quite um, intensively is locus of control, sometimes referred to as self-efficacy, which is a belief um, in your own abilities to affect the most important uh, outcomes in your life. And this is a, a character trait that other researchers and my own research has demonstrated to be very beneficial to um, labor market outcomes and educational outcomes. So that is the only skill that is a little bit more malleable in adolescence. Um, but otherwise, we find this relative strong um, stability of these character traits. So that, then I thought, well, I have to go even further in the time of explaining um, potential uh, gradients in these character trajectories and also in, in the factors that really affect this. So you can't look at this without looking at what parents do. And I always classify the parent parental behavior as the good, the bad and the ugly. And I really think that most researchers are really concerned about the good. They're asking how can we stimulate these kids and how much investment, time and material investments do we have to do. But there's very little research on, on the bad and the ugly. So my research contributes to all three uh, strands of this literature. So in some of my research I really look at the standard parenting behaviors. Um, in terms of how much investment do these parents make in time of time or monetary investments and what are their parenting styles. And parenting styles is something that refers to the way how parents discipline their children and what type of long-term relationships they are establishing with their kids. And one application of this type of research is we try to understand better why some children who come from very disadvantaged backgrounds perform really well in school or in standard uh, achievement tests and why some children who come from very privileged backgrounds perform relatively poorly on these type of standardized test scores or in school. And we figured out that the parenting styles 
and these parental investments are very important in determining these upward and downward mobilities. So, for instance, children who come from relatively privileged backgrounds but perform very poorly tend to have parents who do not have very good parenting styles. And whereas children who come from very disadvantaged backgrounds but perform so well, so therefore are early in life already upward mobile, they usually have parents who invest a lot in their children in terms of reading to the children, taking them to the museum. So this is a type of research where we, where we think that upward mobility is shaped very early in life of these kids and it depends on what these parents are doing. So for instance, in, in disadvantaged families, parents can compensate very well for the lack of financial resources or educational resources. And so this could be a very hopeful um, policy for helping children to go up the ranks in the social ladder. So what, what, I, what I believe, or how I conclude, what I conclude from this research is that poverty or childhood poverty is not necessarily defined via scarcity of educational resources or scarcity of financial resources, but really it, would, it could be a scarcity in parenting resources and in particular, um, the question of what these parents are willing to do for the children and how they interact with their children. In, in other areas of my research, I really look at um, child maltreatment. And this is a very sad topic because when you look at um, surveys, you do find that um, there is a much larger proportion of children who claim, when they're adults, who claim that they have had experiences of sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, or neglect. So we have, I've done work together with um, Jason Fletcher from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and we have looked into the causal impact of these type of experiences on young adulthood personality traits, so character traits. So we had data on the big five personality traits, such as conscientiousness, neuroticism, openness to experience, and so on. And using exploiting differences in these experiences between siblings, we do find that those siblings who claim that they have had um, such experiences as parental neglect, they tend to be significantly and substantially less likely to be conscientious and much more likely to be neurotic in, in early adulthood. There's also a very strong impact of sexual abuse on uh, neuroticism. But the sample sizes are very small for, for sexual abuse, so we have not so much certainty whether this holds. But we believe that these very negative experiences can, can shape character traits very dramatically. Um, in another piece of research, we looked into the um, evolution of one specific non-cognitive skill over the life course from childhood up into middle age of age 42. And here we identified various parenting factors, but what we found from this analysis is that what fathers are doing, where the fathers are really there and interested into the education of the child, is a, is a very strong determinant of lifelong internal locus of control tendencies. And what that means is that these children whose fathers were very involved in the education, as assessed by a school teacher, that these kids tend to be uh, much more likely to be internally controlled. And they are, it almost neutralizes the probability to be externally controlled. And what the difference is that, what we know from my own research and other researches is that people who have these internal locus of control beliefs, they're more successful in the labor market, they're more likely to accumulate education over the life course, they're much more likely to invest into their health. So you can forecast, so to speak, the, um, the different trajectories in these outcomes over the life course of um, children and young adults who have different beliefs. So this type of research is of course limited because it's all derived from, from survey data. So in the last two years, two to three years, I have invested heavily into uh, establishing a new or building a new data infrastructure that allows us to take this research to a much higher level. So in the last years, I've invested heavily in, um, into building up a linked administrative data structure that allows us to follow children from birth up until, let's say, when they're in their early 20s. 
and we see all of their health care utilization data and um, school achievement data and their contact with child protection services and their contact with criminal justice. That allows us to ask a much more important policy question. So can public policy um, in fact influence the way how human development is shaped over the life course of these children. And it does not only allow us to evaluate certain policies, but it allows us, at least in the Australian context, to evaluate the rate of returns of specific policies. So at the moment we are studying, for instance, certain policy reforms that affected the way how welfare payments were, um, were managed in one specific area in, in Australia, in the Northern Territory, and whether this change in the welfare policy had an impact of the well-being of children. And by well-being, I really mean in the broader sense, health, um, schooling outcomes, school attendance. And it also allows us to evaluate um, the way how standards healthcare is being conducted and whether early life medical interventions are having a long-term impact on how skill trajectories are evolving for, for children in the Northern Territory. And then we can calculate all the positive um, externalities and the negative externalities that such type of interventions have. And then we can calculate what would, get, what would the government get back in terms of dollars by investing, let's say, $3,000 for an extra day of medical care at birth. So such type of data resource allows us to ask a very simple question and to answer it. So do prima facie very expensive welfare programs or family programs, um, do they have long-term benefits for society at large? And we can calculate this because we can now study uh, the impact of such reforms on not only on children's health care utilization early in life, but also their behavior in school and their probability of getting into conflict with the law. And um, so at the moment, we're spending a lot of time in this research collaboration to identify policies and health care reforms that could be evaluated. And why this is important is we are actually creating now insights that are relevant for the current policy environment. So we're not studying any policies that, that happened 20 or 30 years ago. So all these policies that we're evaluating are relevant for policymakers now today. So it has for uh, practitioners, clinical practitioners, that has immediate clinical relevance. And for policymakers who are sitting now, for instance, in prime minister and cabinet or in parliament, this is important because they can feed back this type of information and readjust their policies. I would like to add something also to, um, to the child protection, to the question of child protection. So we now have in, in these collaborations, we now have access to the whole universe of records of um, child protection data of these children. So we can use this child protection data to, to quantify the economic burden of cases of maltreatment, neglects or sexual and physical abuse, at least of those cases that were established by a court. Um, and therefore, um, there had been consequences on the lives of the children. So all my research in, in the Northern Territory is um, highly sensitive research because we are studying very fragile and very vulnerable populations. There's a very large degree of Aboriginal children in the Northern Territory. So that means that I, that I and my research colleagues have an enormous social responsibility of whatever we find in our research studies, this could impact dramatically the lives of these children. So what I have learned in the last years is to A, to consult a lot with the populations that we serve and their representatives, and to understand this as a social responsibility. So as traditionally as a researcher, you would be only concerned about peer review and you would be concerned about, all the, about the technical correctness of your identification strategies. But now suddenly we have the social responsibility that we could actually harm children's lives or their families' lives by communicating research findings to the public before we have really um, communicated this to the communities and assessed the potential consequences that could have. I think a lot of 
um, academic resources were channeled into studying parental investments, all these positive parenting behaviors. I think there is too little research focused on these bad and very negative behaviors. And the reason is obvious because there is very little data that we can use in this space. But I, I truly believe that um, there is a lot of unobservable behaviors of parents whenever they are being interviewed in surveys. They of course show their best behaviors and they, they would always um, well, they would have a tendency to over-report the good behaviors because it's socially desirable. But I think there's an enormous responsibility of studying these very bad behaviors because these could scar children for, a li for life. And so I think there's, it's important to study these type behaviors. And that brings me to, to some research that is conducted by Emily Putnam Hohenstein at the University of Southern California, who has, together with her research colleagues, built up possibly the best linked administrative data resource in the world with the Californian linked um, administrative data where they are studying long term the causes and the consequences of child maltreatment. And what is so special about their research is that they're not only trying to uh, produce academic output but they're trying to collaborate with the communities to find workable solutions to, um, to improve child maltreatment cases or to help communities and parents to improve upon the parenting behaviors. And this is important because um, once you're researching maltreatment, you're, you could potentially point your finger on families or on communities. And you do not want to do this because there may be an underlying reason why there, there is a high proportion of maltreatment in, in communities. And I don't think that you can understand these behaviors in the aggregate if you don't understand the socioeconomic um, causes of these type of behaviors. So I really understand family policy as the new growth policy. So when I started out as, a, as an undergraduate student, I was very interested in growth economics, simply for the fact because I was interested in how the dynamics work um, of the productivity of potential of an economy and how you can produce surplus. But what I always thought was missing from this debate was that um, the, the productivity potential of an economy really depends on its human capital. It depends on the quality of human beings that you're producing. And over the past 10 years, family policy has really become the, the, the objective and the target of applied microeconomists. And now, um, a series of research studies are showing that um, human development depends so much on, on family policy, the way how you structure parental leave payments, welfare payments, and how much support you give parents. So from this perspective, I really think family policy is the new growth policy, and you can't have an innovation-oriented economy without looking into the, the determinants of character formation. And please allow me this last word. So some economists uh, would think, why would we be really interested in character formation? And I would like to, to give a couple of examples. So think, for instance, um, tax policy. How could you think that tax compliance works in a population that is not honest or that doesn't have social preferences? Or if you think about innovation policies, could you even imagine inventors um, that produce the next great innovation without having a notion of persistence and openness to new experiences or, no, or to new ideas? So I think this, these are the reasons why character formation should really be in the center of economic theory and of applied economic research. <laughs>